Hey, thanks for joining us again. I'm Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at The Spring in Desert Hot Springs. And today we're going to take a little bit of a break from our series on the book of Romans. Don't worry, in a few weeks we're going to come back to Romans. But today I wanted to take a few minutes to share some thoughts with you that I have been compiling over the last year or so. See, as a church, we're an Assembly of God church, which means that we are a Pentecostal church. And people have all kinds of ideas about what it means to be Pentecostal, what Pentecostalism is, uh, and, and whether you're familiar with the term or not, you might even have some concept as we start to get into the topic today. So I just want to take today and next week as well to share some thoughts I've compiled over the last few years around this idea of what it means to be Pentecostal, who the Holy Spirit is, and, and really what it means for our identity as Christians. So I'm going to share some thoughts with you today. We're going to look at a little piece of scripture, and then next week we're going to dive in and get into even more depth as we talk about the Holy Spirit and his role in our lives. Are you ready? I want to pray for us today. Pray with me. Father, thanks for this day. Thanks for my friends that have tuned in. I pray that you would speak during these next few moments, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So some first thoughts for you. Why is it that everyone gets weirded out when Christians start talking about the supernatural, right? I, I mean, people will wear crystals, they'll, they'll do yoga, uh, you know, they'll howl at the moon, they'll meditate, and they'll, they'll um, you know, they'll, they'll do stuff like, you know, I'm waiting for the universe to, to bring it to me. I'm trying to manifest this. People will try all sorts of spiritualities, but the second that a Christian begins speaking about the supernatural or the spiritual, People get weirded out for it. We're the ones that are viewed as strange for b believing in the supernatural, and yet we're not the ones that are walking around saying, you know, wear these crystals, burn this sage in your house, do this sort of thing. We're not doing that. See, the trouble is people want to have these designer spiritualities where they can pull together all these superstitions and practices and make their own sort of thing and, and make it work on their terms. But to be a Christian means that you're a part of a rich thousands of years old tradition of spirituality and belief in the supernatural. So first of all, for all my friends that might be tuning in today that say, you know, I'm not sure about being a Christian. I'm just checking out this message today. Listen, I get it. You have questions about the spiritual or the supernatural. Let's just call it a truce here and say, you know what? It probably actually makes sense for people that are Christians to believe in the supernatural because their fundamental belief is that God put on human flesh and dwelt among us. Our fundamental belief as Christians is that same God who put on flesh and dwelt among us, lived a perfect and sinless life, died on the cross, and then three days later rose from the dead. We believe in the supernatural. That's who we are. That's what makes a Christian a Christian. So let's not get weirded out when Christians believe in the supernatural, especially since there's so many other stranger practices that work in the world today. Let's as Christians, recognize that we do have thousands of years of good practice behind us. So let's not get caught up in all these latest little trends, but instead, let's maybe learn from the rich history of our faith. You see, Christians have thousands of years of spiritual practices that, that range from the extremely practical to the extremely supernatural. If anything, we should actually be viewed as the reliable authority on being spiritual people in our culture. We should be. We should be the people in our culture that people will look at and say, yes, Christians and their spirituality, we can rely on them because they are drawing from thousands of years of spiritual practice and spiritual tradition, as opposed to the person that's coming up with some sort of new wave form of Buddhism in their own design and in their own fashion. No, the trouble is this. People get weirded out when they think about the supernatural or the spiritual because they forget something. See, we live in a world where people like segmentation, right? We, we, we like categories and we, we like nice, tidy containers. Think of it this way. As, as people, we like to be able to say that, you know, we have our lives that are our work lives. We have our weekend life. We have our family life. We have our online life. We like to have all these compartments. But the truth is, you are a whole being, a holistic person. And no matter what you might think, you might think that you're taking, uh, you know, your work self, your home self, you know, all this, everywhere you go, you're only taking yourself. You don't have a different identity in each place. You may have a different role, but you don't have a different identity. And the problem is that we like to dissect and separate 
the spiritual from the natural, right? We, we like to say that if something is spiritual or supernatural, that it has its own category, it's over here, it's on its own, instead of saying that maybe the two are actually integrated. Listen, if God wanted you to be nothing but spiritual all the time, he would have made you a spirit. And if God wanted you to be nothing but natural all the time, he would have only given you a body. Instead, he gave you both, and he made you both. It's a full integration of who you are. You are a spirit, soul, and body, all integrated into one. You are spirit, soul, body, one being, all integrated into one. And if that's the case, then it's important for us to recognize that everything is spiritual. Everything's spiritual. The way you live your life each and every day, it's an act of spirituality. The way you go to work and the way you do your job, it's an act of your spirituality. The way that you interact with your family, your spouse, your children, it is your spirituality. It is a spiritual action because you cannot separate the spiritual from the natural. We are fully integrated beings. Everything you are, everything you do, everything you say is spiritual activity. I want you to think in those terms because it's really easy to say, here's my spiritual life, here's my not so spiritual life and try to separate them when they're supposed to be integrated. In fact, when we look at the Bible as Christians, we look at a book that was written in a few ancient languages. The Old Testament, the Old Testament has no word for spiritual or spirituality in it. It has a word for spirit and we'll talk about that, but it doesn't have a word for spiritual or spirituality in it. In Hebrew, in fact, the, the word for spirit is, is a bit different than what we might expect it to be. There's no, there's no sense that something is spiritual in its nature. In fact, in the Hebrew or Jewish mind, the mind of Jesus that he would have taught in, everything we do is spiritual. We're not segmented beings. We are holistic beings. Your physical life and your spiritual life are inseparable because they are one and the same. The Hebrew word for spirit is the word ruach, which literally means breath. And, and so to think about what it means to be spirit or to have spirit, it means to have life and to have life in you. And that's the context we want to talk about today. We want to talk about what it means to be spiritual. Now, as a church, like I said, we are a Pentecostal church. And what that means to some people and to others is two different things. Some people hear the word Pentecostal and they're cool with it. They grew up with it. They understand it. They know what it's about. Other people hear that word and there's all kinds of cultural weight and baggage that comes with it. Uh, Pentecostals, aren't they the ones that swing from the chandeliers and do cartwheels up and down the aisle and they're weird and they speak in tongues and they do this and they do that? Listen, Pentecostalism and being a Pentecostal person simply means that you believe that the Spirit of God lives inside of believers and empowers those believers for the supernatural, to live as supernatural beings in a world that is spiritual. We shouldn't be scared of spirit or spiritual because as Christians, it's a part of who we are. So think of it this way. To be Pentecostal is to be a person of the spirit. But what spirit? Well, we're talking specifically about the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. And so we need to take a little bit of time to talk about who the Holy Spirit is and, who, and, and, and how he functions in the life of a believer. But before we get there, I want to take you to a passage of Scripture. This is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And this passage is why people in our stream of Christianity are called Pentecostals, because this is about the day of Pentecost, the day when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church. It's honestly the day that the church comes into existence. And it is really the very first sign that the church exists, is that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells the people of God. So here's what it says. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, reads like this. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled upon each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages or in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So 
we need to talk about who the Holy Spirit is if we're going to understand what it is for Christians to be filled with the Spirit and to practice spirituality as a Christian. We have to understand who the Spirit of God is, who the Holy Spirit is, because we're not just practicing random, make-me-feel-good things. We are practicing a relationship with God, the divine presence living within us and flowing through us. So, who is the Holy Spirit? If there's one thing that I want you to think about the Holy Spirit, it's simply this, that the Holy Spirit gives life. That's what he comes to do. The Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit is a life giver. It is his fundamental nature. Everything he does should be causing us to grow and to mature. He's not interested in making you weird. He's interested in making you more alive and using you to bring life to others. If you know a spirit-filled weirdo, then the odds are good that they were already weird before they were filled with the Spirit of God. Now, let me, let me point this out. Some people are just like, I've, I've met Pentecostals, and they're just weird. They talk strangely. They've got this weird culture. Listen, on behalf of Pentecostals everywhere, we're not all weird. Some of us are very normal, mundane people. If somebody is really weird, though, it's probably because they were weird before they had the Spirit of God. And then they just got a little more weird with the Spirit of God. Does that make sense? Like they were already weird, and then they became more weird because they thought they should be more weird in order to be spiritual. That's usually the way that goes. Listen, the Spirit comes to give life, not to give weird. He might cause someone to be a little different, or he might do something that's unusual or unfamiliar, but he's never gonna be weird. He's never gonna be silly. We shouldn't be scared of the supernatural. It, it should be viewed as a normal part of the life of all believers. Christians are people that pray. We pray and we believe that God will do the miraculous. Well, there's nothing more supernatural than that. Believing that God will intervene in the world in a very real and tangible way, that's as supernatural as it gets. We shouldn't be weirded out by the supernatural. Now, are there people who get weird about the supernatural? Sure. That's because they're weird, not because the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit's a life giver. He comes to give life. Sometimes giving life doesn't feel like what we would call a happy experience. Uh, you know, sometimes giving life is, is a work of pain. There's pain in the pruning work of the Holy Spirit. There's pain in the, the, the work of giving birth. Sometimes bringing life is painful. So sometimes giving life, the work of the Spirit, isn't necessarily what we would call a happy experience. The pruning work of the Holy Spirit may at times seem or appear to be painful, but it's still a life-giving work. It's still a life-giving work. The Spirit's work in bringing life is often joyful, and it is always cathartic. It's often joyful, always cathartic. The Holy Spirit's work is always to bring life. So if that's to reveal something in you that is causing death, so that you can set it aside, a sinful behavior, a, a, a way of thinking, something that just isn't being helpful to you, sure, cutting away feels painful. It feels like death. But the Spirit comes to give life. The Spirit comes to give life. We must not fear the emotions that are acquainted with the work of the Holy Spirit. And we must not be dependent on an emotional experience either. Sometimes Pentecostals are noted for being a more emotional bunch. We are an expressive people. People of the Spirit are an expressive people. And that's a true statement. But what I want us to also be is a thoughtful people. Because we can be. Because this is a fully integrated experience where logic and reason and the supernatural all come together. The Holy Spirit working in the life of a Christian, in the life of a believer, is about him giving life to that believer and to the work of that believer and to give life to the experiences of all those that would experience that believer. Like I said, sometimes giving life means cutting away some death, but it's still giving life. And there may be emotions involved. You may experience the Holy Spirit's presence in your life and it might bring you to tears. He might fill you with joy. He might cause you to feel peace. Listen, the emotional experience is wonderful, 
but we must not be dependent upon it because an emotional experience is not the Holy Spirit. We don't chase an emotional experience. The Holy Spirit is God himself. As Luke records in Acts, the Holy Spirit is God's spirit coming and dwelling in the people of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't just show up in a person's life to make them emotional. He's interested in life-giving maturity and growth. That's what he comes to do. He comes to give life and maturity and growth. These experiences can be accompanied by emotions, though, and that's not a bad thing because we are emotive beings. We need ways to express our experiences, but we must not live for the emotional experience. We must instead live in the spirit to allow him to cause maturity and growth in us. How do you know if the spirit of God is at work in a person? You see that person growing in Christian maturity. That's how you know. It's not through signs and wonders and miracles. It's not because they speak in tongues more than anybody. It's not because they sing louder or shout hallelujah at the top of their lungs. We know that the Holy Spirit is at work in the life of a believer if the Holy Spirit is causing that believer to grow in maturity. Listen, all of this is to say one simple thing. We are spiritual beings. We are not just physical, natural beings. We are also spiritual beings. And that means that we have to embrace the supernatural. While others may have these random practices they pull together, Christians have these baseline practices of prayer and worship and the reading of scripture and meditating in the spirit and trusting in God. We have all of these practices that we can anchor our lives to. Your life is more than just your natural life. And maybe today your thought is simply this, that, that, that you feel like you've been surrounded by a lot of death and it's time to experience life. Well, the Holy Spirit has come to give life and that all starts in a relationship with Jesus. Jesus comes that we might have life and live it fully in him. And maybe today that's what you need. You need to come into relationship with Jesus so that you might be filled with the life-giving spirit of God. If today you need to give your life to Jesus, I like to say it's as easy as A, B, C. A, you need to admit. You need to admit that you're a sinner, someone that has lived in rebellion to God. B, you need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus is the one and the only one that can save you from your sins. And C, you need to choose. You need to choose today and every day to follow Jesus. Admit you're a sinner, believe he's the Savior, and choose to follow him. If today that's what you want to do, you want to give your life to Jesus, I want to lead you in a simple prayer right where you're at. Pray it like this. Pray it out loud. Pray it like you mean it. Pray it like you're a person who is spiritual. Pray like this. Jesus, I give you my life. It all starts right there. One simple prayer. And now each and every day, you will learn what it is to live in the spirit of God, in the presence of Jesus, as a Christian, as someone who's given their life to Christ. Now, if you prayed that prayer today and you're here in Coachella Valley and you say, you know, I don't have a local church, come visit us at the spring in person. We would love to follow Jesus together with you. If you're not in the valley, that's fine. Find a great local Bible teaching church and become a part of that church because that's how we learn to practice the spirituality. Listen, this was like a, a shotgun blast of information today. You're going to dissect some of it. And then next week, I want to dive into this even more. So make sure you subscribe, you like, you comment, do all those things. And then next week, we're going to dive in even deeper into these ideas surrounding who the Holy Spirit is, what Pentecostalism is, and what it means to live as a person of the Spirit. See you then.